Hello everyone, welcome to Rural Water Resource Management, week 3 lecture 5. Uh, in the previous lectures, we looked about groundwater and spent some extra time on groundwater resource because one of the important factors for rubby season or non-monsoon irrigation for rural water. Uh, I stopped with uh, some data collected from groundwater board and uh, government data. And we looked at how it is being used to understand critical blocks, etc. So that is one way of monitoring the groundwater availability, um, groundwater issues, etc. in the country. But please understand that that doesn't about the movement of water. It only documents we have a level here, and now is it coming down or going up? Where is the water going? It is very very hard to visualize and connect, uh, unlike your surface water. So for that concept, we have groundwater models. And these are very complex uh, code uh, heavy driven models uh, where you have um, equations solved for the groundwater properties and groundwater hydraulics. Okay, So the hydrology would look into how water comes into the uh, system for groundwater and then gets relocated along your porous spaces and then moves as it establishes a head or a potential. So the models are many and plenty in number. And uh, I would be talking about one model that I've used in the past, uh, which is Modflow. And it is an open source model. And we will look into how it is being built. So it is based on physical equations, as I said. Um, and water moves from one place to the other and also on the soil properties and the geological properties. So basically it is a 3D model, a model uh, which first you see from the top down. So maybe I'm looking uh, at a map from the top down and I can see a boundary. You see this is the boundary of your aquifer or boundary of your model where you want to model. Then if you go deep into the model, you could see that it is a layered 3D model. When we were discussing about groundwater, we mentioned that visualize a cross section and inside the cross section, you have layers like a cake. I use the term like look at this as a cake. We have a cake layer, a cream layer, a cake layer, something like that. Similarly, uh, a 3D visual is needed. So these conceptual models are being made by Modflow wherein you have the first layer on the top and then a layer which is uh, impervious or it is stopping the groundwater movement and then a deep aquifer layer. So here you could see the first layer is slight green um, and then a darker green uh, layer, but it is not continuous. It is not continuous. It goes and stops, which means some layers exist not for the whole part of the aquifer, but for partly uh, and it could be because of the weathering of the rock. Then you have two more uh, aquifer layers, which are uh, slight gray and darker gray in color. They move a uh, little bit higher than the green color. And then you have the uh, darker orange and orange, which go throughout the boundary. So what you see here, and these images are taken from Modflow, uh, the multiple Modflow platforms. Uh, I'm showing examples from Aqua View. Uh, so what you see here is uh, water comes from the top and then uh, rainfall water infiltration percolation. Then water gets relocated along the layer. And after it gets recharged, it goes down, down, down to the deepest part of your groundwater aquifer. So in between, sometimes it will not move beyond a permeable layer. So all this has to be captured in your model. How do you capture these in your model? It is by data and field observations. You should know how many layers are present, distinct layers uh, in your uh, location and how long it extends. For example, if I take a 
bore log here, I found one, two, three, four, five, six, seven layers. If I go here, I only found four layers. So which means three of the layers are truncating. So we should know by interpolation, which are the layers that are truncating. So all this is done by the model. All you have to give is at different locations, the water level record and the stratigraphy record, which means the layering of your aquifers. So this requires a lot of field work and this is where the aquifer mapping activities of the government of India is being done. That's why it takes a long time. You have to take multiple samples, bring it to the lab, analyze what material it is. If it is distinctly different from a different depth, then it is a different layer. It is somewhat closer, then they just merge it into one layer. Okay. Most of the groundwater models for uh, study purposes, research purposes have three layers. Uh, the, from the top ground surface, you have the unconfined aquifer, and then maybe one or two uh, impermeable layers. So there's one layer, uh, unconfined aquifer, there's a confined aquifer, another confined aquifer. So almost three uh, would, would be okay to model. Otherwise you need a bigger model computing software or even uh, hardware like a good computer to model of these. So I've shown you that uh, just data would be enough to understand just the level but not the movement of groundwater and to understand the movement of groundwater there is a need for physical based models. When I say physical based it is driven by physical equations not empirical equations. Empirical equations are based on statistics and it is just a correlation relation kind of a function. Physical equations actually take the physics behind the groundwater movement, for example, hydraulic conductivity, the change in pressure heads, uh, and then they calculate the movement of water. So for physical based system, there's a need of a lot of data. So there are a lot of issues which we will go through and I am defining what are the issues. Uh, and please bear with me when I do extend the groundwater issues a little bit because India is the biggest groundwater extractor in the world. Studies and government reports say almost uh, India's groundwater extraction is bigger than the next competitors together, combined together, which is India is, which means that India's groundwater use is much bigger than US groundwater extraction and the extraction by China put together. So we have to be more protective of the groundwater resource. Yes, it has helped to improve the economy uh, by means of increase in agricultural productivity, better livelihood options like sanitation um, and uh, improved uh, lifestyles, etc. But we need to preserve it otherwise it would be back to base one. So uh, groundwater data issues, let's go through some of them. Some of them are not representative. Uh, when I was teaching the groundwater level uh, wells, I told that some wells are farmer wells, which are representative, which means that when you pump water from uh, a well uh, and then take the same reading uh, or uh, come again a couple of days later, then take a reading, then it is a representative well. It, it represents the actual system where water is being used for pumping, etc. But in some regions, you would see that the monitoring wells are not disturbed, which means they are not pumped. It is only for monitoring. So it won't capture the dynamics in groundwater because it is disconnected. It may be disconnected from the farm groundwater reality. So that is non-representativeness. Less frequency uh, because of the cost in manpower and or collection of data. There is very less frequency of data, both spatially and what do I mean frequency less in spatial? Uh, I mean that there could be much more number of wells, uh, much better spread of wells. We saw that Rajasthan, Gujarat uh, is in the red color, uh, but uh, the number of wells is also less. So some more coverage uh, of wells can be there. So that is a higher frequency, improving the frequency of spatial uh, representation of wells. 
deployment of wells. Then we come to temporal issues. Uh, only four times a year it is being monitored. Is this enough? A lot of studies say that we need to improve it because uh, the pumping doesn't happen only in those regions. It can be a cumulative effect. So what you are studying uh, by looking at a pre-monsoon level is the cumulated water use impact on the groundwater level in the post uh, pre-monsoon um, levels. In the post-monsoon levels, it is also a cumulative effect of recharge. So now here comes the question. So which month is most uh, important for groundwater recharge uh, activities? We don't know because it is a cumulative effect. So we'll have to put much more effort in monitoring the wells. For example, in developed countries, uh, you would see that the wells are monitored almost every day by automatic sensors, but it is pretty costly. Uh, but other wells are at least monitored once a month, at least once a month. So low density and concentration, sometimes what happens is a state might have enough number of wells, uh, but they are not spread out equally. Uh, some areas are low density, whereas some areas are concentrated. So issue should be more or less taken care of. Otherwise, uh, the representative coming back to point one uh, might be an issue uh, in the learnings from groundwater, such groundwater data. However, I do acknowledge that there are a lot of cost issues involved. Uh, we need to understand that um, because of the complexity involved in groundwater, both the capacity, a lot, lot of people know about groundwater monitoring, so uh, measurements. So uh, there's a lot of cost in bringing up the capacity. There's a lot of cost in putting a well and also measuring it. Uh, just one pressure transducer I was saying that you put in a piezometer or a deep aquifer well, uh, it would cost around uh, $700 to $1,000, which is approximately 70,000 rupees. Um, and that tape measure I showed you is one lakh rupees. So now you could understand that it is very expensive to uh, monitor these wells. So it is, um, we need to find better ways. We need to find better uh, technologies, cheaper, cost effectively uh, to manage and monitor the ground. Some wells are abandoned and are not disconnected. Uh, if you go and look at the data, some wells would have data, data, and then suddenly no data. Uh, those are the abandoned wells. People stop recording for some reason. Um, and other ways uh, is uh, they are disconnected. Okay, so they are not connected to the public region, or they might be present somewhere else. So these kind of issues, uh, because they didn't understand the under underground complexity and where to place the wells. Again, I'm not uh, talking about a particular agency. Most of the agencies in India go through these issues. Uh, so there's a lot of different agencies that are monitoring groundwater, both central, state, but we have to be understanding which wells that we are monitoring. Some wells are polluted. When I was in the field, we didn't see a lot of wells polluted, so which means it is level is increasing, but it is not good water. So we'll have to be very careful uh, if you're monitoring and measuring good water or is it polluted water? For example, an industry might be discharging uh, pollutants and pollutants move into the groundwater levels and increase the groundwater levels. Uh, so is it a good sign to show a higher water level, uh, but with polluted water is the question. So it has to be good water. So always look at if the wells are polluted. Uh, sometimes metering is not possible uh, because of the complexity of the wells. So sometimes the, uh, the sides of the wells are so rugged that it is not possible for metering. Contamination, uh, pollution uh, moves, okay, so pollution moves and sometimes contamination also happens. Some people purposely put in this uh, bad water. So the, like you see how streams and rivers are black in some areas. Uh, similarly, contamination also can be in the groundwater levels because it is a storage underground. So if you push water in, then water goes into the groundwater 
and gets contaminated. For them, it's easy. They just put the black water inside, uh, but then they're, they're actually spoiling uh, groundwater. So when you go and collect data, please be uh, understanding of these issues for groundwater. Always have to do a data quality check, which means uh, data representing what is happening. Uh, for example, if there is good rainfall in the monsoon and you see a good uh, water level increase, which is good. Okay, so that, that's a good data quality check. Suddenly, if you see a groundwater level increasing and throughout a drought year, something is wrong. So that's what I'm trying to say is data quality check. Sometimes you would see the same water levels uh, multiple times in the data set. Um, I'm talking about a state data set that I recently bought for research and we saw a lot of issues in the data like data errors, duplication, which means one level is the same across all the months, which is not possible. Um, and then sometimes you would see um, a data which doesn't make sense because the units have been changed. So please understand that I had mentioned earlier to be very careful with the units because if you spill the units here, then your data is off. So one side is the groundwater data issue and the other side is the groundwater management issues. Um, right now we have Central Groundwater Board, uh, which is their uh, body other than the state PWDs. Uh, it will be good to have more agencies involved. For example, irrigation uh, looks at uh, the irrigation department looks at water supply for agriculture, but uh, it is mostly through the surface water, which is dams, canals, etc. Uh, but a good portion of water is also being used from groundwater. So uh, some some convergence of uh, management could help preserve groundwater and spatial and temporal resolution of uh, the data, the management activities, mapping, etc. Uh, some empirical methods are being used, for example, to understand the infiltration and recharge rates. Uh, those should be backed up with physical based models. It is time consuming to run a model like Modflow, but in the long run, it does help because you have a 3D picture of your aquifer rather than an empirical model, which is just a 1D, which means rainfall, infiltration, runoff. Okay, so there's not much dynamics uh, laterally also. So groundwater, when it comes in, it doesn't only move down vertically, it can also move planar, X, Y plane also it can move. So along the uh, Z axis, it can move up and down, up due to capillary and down due to gravity, uh, but also it can move X, Y plane so that, that cannot be captured by empirical methods. Some methods are outdated um, because how do you account for pollution? How do you account for deep aquifer connectivities? Um, there are too many wells that, that have been abandoned. So all these uh, need to be double checked. There's a lot of one size fits all for groundwater management activities. For example, check people claim that uh, can be on water, uh, but can it recharge across all of India is the question. So just because it reaches one area, uh, it doesn't mean that it can recharge across India. So if you remember the traditional water harvesting uh, slide I showed or the traditional water body slide I showed, you saw that in traditionally across India, it is not the same method that has been used throughout. For example, we had Airy or, or ponds in uh, Tamil Nadu and uh, uh, terrace farming along with water storage along the terrace. Uh, you saw that in uh, Jharkhand, Nagaland, etc. So there is a big difference. And so one size fits all approach should not be used. And because there are data issues, uh, we should look at different data platforms to be implemented with uh, the uh, observed data. So here I'm showing the only satellite in the world that can uh, monitor and map groundwater, which is the gravity recovery and climate experiment for GRACE satellite. It is a combined mission uh, led by the NASA team. And uh, they also have other data from different satellites for other parameters that contribute to the groundwater hydrology, for example, your soil moisture, your rainfall, et cetera. So those data can be collected from global land data assimilation systems or GLDAS. 
All of these are open source. Uh, and the Bhuvan GIS are uh, remote sensing observed data. So these are obtained from the government of India's website where you could map the land use land cover. So if I know how much rainfall is coming, if I know by land use land cover map, what kind of crop is grown, I would know what water is remaining for the ground water recharge. And all these different parameters can be put together to understand groundwater dynamics. So, so you could clearly see that I'm not omitting observed data. Observed data is important. Uh, it has to be the first data that you would use, but because of the spatial and temporal scale, you are adding some remote sensing data along with it. Okay. So this is how GRACE would look at it, the globe. It is not uh, the same smooth sphere, uh, but there are a lot of disturbances on the land because of changes in gravity. Gravity is not the same across the planet. And using that concept, it measures groundwater. So all remote sensing data are giving you a proxy of uh, what is happening. So by these methods, you can actually estimate groundwater recharge at a higher spatial and temporal scale. The only drawback is remote sensing methods uh, cannot be used for a field level analysis or even a village level analysis. You'll have to do it at a state level. So even state level is not agreed upon, but at least uh, you know South India or Indian subcontinent level uh, is okay. So uh, it gives you some pictures and you could see here that uh, blue color means higher groundwater uh, or terrestrial water storage. You could see that higher water storage is available along the Himalayan regions because of the snow. Uh, those kind of things we could understand from this. Uh, those who are interested in GRACE papers can look at more uh, GRACE related papers. There are multiple papers, even for India, that has been published widely. On the whole, uh, still there's more data needed and more people are needed to convert uh, remote sensing data into a usable format for which IIT Bombay uh, led the Mapathon event uh, last December. Uh, and uh, we actually uh, look how we could engage people, map different um, locations in India and also use ISRO data, which is Government of India's data for um, research purposes, for analytic purposes, and to have a better understanding. Okay, so we cannot expect every time a government agency to map and give you a land use land cover, for example. So it is um, those people who are interested should get on the ground and help these kind of data activities. So this event was a great success where we had 9,000 participants uh, just to show that uh, collecting data doesn't require just a government agency, but you could work along with the government remote sensing data platforms to generate some data. And depending on the quality of data, someone can use it. So that aspect is always very important. The key players here were uh, ISRO because they are the Indian Space Research Organization for Indian Satellite Data, uh, Indian Show Technology Bombay, and AICTE. Uh, and within IIT Bombay, we have the FOSI, which were funding and spoken tutorial, etc. So it was a great success, and we look forward to doing this again. Point of showing this here is to say that there is a lot of data needed. Um, and conversion of these remote sensing data into products can be done by collective action. So the recap for week three, we looked at hydrological parameters. Overall, we had around 10, 15 parameters, but we said, okay, for rural water management, it's not needed to look at all of the 15 parameters, but more important focused parameters. So we looked at precipitation, evapotranspiration, and And in the current week, which is week three, we look at surface water storage structures, uh, how water is stored in depressions, then leading into channels, streams, and finally rivers and lakes, etc. Uh, then we looked at soil moisture. So whatever water is uh, stored, uh, and after that, some water is run off, whatever the remaining water does move down due to gravity uh, and it gets stored in the soil profile for plant use or evaporation, uh, which is uh, together called as evapotranspiration. So soil moisture, we looked into detail. 
and we looked at how to measure all these uh, different parameters. And for groundwater, we took uh, one more lecture extra, uh, given the importance of groundwater and rural water management. Um, and uh, because now you cannot see everywhere people having channels uh, or canal command areas for their irrigation plots, but you do see a groundwater uh, pump uh, and a groundwater well. So uh, sometimes one well can be used for five different farmers uh, on a rotation basis. So that the groundwater has actually increased the access to water, community farming, et cetera, et cetera. There are downsides, which because if one person uses too much, the other person does not have water. Uh, but those are the management issues that we'll be looking at uh, when we come to rural water management issues. So with this, uh, I would like to uh, conclude uh, the week finished discussing about the hydrological cycle, we will move now more into the aspects of water management because now you would have an understanding of what are the, what does precipitation mean, what does water transportation mean, how do you arrest groundwater um, leakages or losses to the system, how to reduce evapotranspiration. So these aspects when we talk about and discuss in class, you will have a better understanding because we have introduced the parameters. Thank you and I will see you in week four.